Hello. So we are all moderators then. Yes. I can see the clear the move a person from the stream. <laughs> I can remove I can, I can remove you from the stream at any time, David. <laughs> thank you. Uh, if I need to click it, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So I do believe that there are there is someone watching. Just as a side note, because there are four people in the in the chat. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I will just give up. Just go on. Go, go on mute and uh, put cameras off until a bit eleven forty then. Thank you. Cool. Talk to you in a minute. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll give it another minute or two before we get started, just to allow in case anyone's joining from another forum.
morning everyone that's just joining. I'm just giving it a couple of minutes before we get started. Good morning, everyone. I think we'll get started and then anyone that just jo joins us will join us. So if we just do a bit of general housekeeping, um, if you've got any questions throughout the session, uh, please feel free to add them in the chat. There will be a element of Q&A and a bit of discussion uh, towards the end of the, till our end of the workshop. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm David Turner. I am the API and Connections product owner for Money Hub Enterprise. Um, I've got two colleagues with me. I've got John Dyer, who is our lead data engineer, and Omar Zampira, uh, who is the our API lead developer. And today I will. Um, and today I would. Um, we're going to have a discussion about how open banking APIs are just a bit more than just data aggregation. Um, for a bit of context, um, for those who are not familiar with Money Hub Enterprise, uh, helps if I'm in the right. We are. We were founded in 2014, and um, we've been focusing on open finance uh, for since then. So that's just as current accounts, that's credit cards, that's savings, that's pensions and investments to give that holistic view of finances. Uh, we also co-founded FData, uh, and we lobby for open, open banking. And when the open banking implementation industry, we worked closely with them and the banks to develop and define the standards that we use today. We are both a AISP and a PISP, and all our APIs are built on open standards and are RESTful and JSON based with all the documentation in, in Swagger or Open API. We have a number of clients ranging from the small fintech startups to large enterprises. And you may see from this screen that they are not just about banks. They are um, companies that are across the spectrum that are using the power of open banking. So open banking has been around for about two years now. And I'm sure you're all fully aware that the uh, as of March 2020 this year, uh, all banks who offer a current account and credit card must offer an interface. But not everyone is realizing the potential of what open banking does. Uh, they very much view of it as a data, it's just merely for data aggregation. And unfortunately, the banks are, uh, a lot of them, uh, of the banks rather, are still focused on compliance rather than innovation. And some of the partners you just saw, and others are now starting to see it. And what I want to do is bring that to life, and that's the real core crux of the, the presentation. But the main powerful use case of banking is giving that holistic view of your finances. So that bringing all your accounts into one crease, that creation of that digital wallet allows users and people to um, categorize their payments so that they can monitor their spending, so that they're able to set budgets and manage their finances more, more efficiently than they did so. And that's become even more important, especially in the current pandemic. But on top of that, they get useful insights, which are both in informational and actions. 
And was combining that with the power of payments, uh, payments functionality via open banking, it just brings that holistic view to manage your uh, financial well-being much more efficiently. But we can achieve much more. And at Money Hub, we are so passionate about in hand, enabling our customers' propositions to come to fruition fastly, quickly, and just unlock that cre cre creativity. And to bring that to life a bit more, so I love playing with um, Lego with my son. One day we're building tanks with the, with the bricks, and then the next day we're building scenes so they can do his animation. We stop motion animation, but I wouldn't want to create the, each individual brick, and I can be assured that my son, who's only six, wouldn't have the attention span to create each brick. And that is what APIs do. They are the building blocks. They ena enable the creativity of, so, of propositions to be realized a lot more quickly. And as you look at more at the, comparing Lego APIs, the, there's even more similarities. So as I said, they're standardized. They're the building blocks. Strong emphasis on um, usability. So, but that needs the documentation with that. And it's very much like the instructions, you need to build a castle or a lighthouse. You need to be able to understand what you can achieve. They're customizable. So you have the options to use different bricks or in this case, APIs for different functionalities. And they're innovative. So the ability, you have the ability to mix and match different APIs to create that value proposition. And just like Lego, we are cons constantly innovating and enhancing our current APIs and adding more so that companies can take a value of those new enhancements or and functionality. And the sky is true, the creative element of APIs is the sky is the limit. Who can imagine 20 years ago, you could build a Millennium Falcon for Lego? And, and literally, and that is why it, APIs are there to help you deliver value to your proposition. They're just not simply about enabling data aggregation. What I want to do now is actually bring that even more to life by showing you some of the innovative APIs that we have at Money Hub Enterprise that we have helped our clients deliver their valuable that value propositions. So the first one I want to talk about is affordability assessments. So I don't know how many people on, on the forum have actually went and applied uh, for a mortgage, going to a mortgage provider. Now, um, I did that a couple of years ago and I had to print off streams of paper of my uh, bank banking statements to show a list of um, transactions. I then had to fill in some forms about what I thought about how much I spent on rent at that, at that time, transport, food, utilities, a, a plethora of information. And what ended up happening is that mortgage provider would then compare and contrast what was on my banking statements to what I'd said on the forms. But they would also go out to a credit reference agency. So that's your like your Equifax, your Experian, your credit, your TransCredit Union, Union, to get a score, a number, which would detect, would really be the crux of whether you would be allowed to have a mortgage or not. Now, the, the bank or the mortgage provider and me didn't really know how that number is calculated. It just literally is a number based on that historic credit management. But if you had an affordability at API, if you use that and use the power of what you can get from open banking, you can get a true view of financial life. So an example we've got on the screen here is that we have an, a nurse who was um, recently promoted four months ago and she changed department. She's got that regular salary going into a joint account. She's also had um, an inheritance come into that account. And also her partner is retired and he's received in, in, into that joint account, they have incomes of pension and some rental properties. And they also have like a little gamble on the lottery or, or, or the horse racing, whatever, but it's all, it's all within their means. That gives a complete holistic view to both them 
to before they even go and apply for a mortgage, but also from a building society or bank or some kind of mortgage trader, they get a true view of that financial life so they can make a more informed decision about whether it is right to give this nurse a mortgage. And that is what one of the true values of having using an API to use and using that data can provide. The next one that, um, I wanted to bring to life is how we've used our payments API to power a charity solution. So this is probably, a, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, this is becoming more a regular occurrence where high streets are becoming empty. And the role of high street was becoming a, a, in question even before the pandemic due to the increase in digital shopping. But a lot of the charities today still rely on cash. And without people, we have seen a 53% drop in donations, especially since the start of the crisis. And we, are, we know from research that people that are, have adopted digital journeys because they've had to, are less likely to return back to using cash after the pandemic, which gives charities an unprecedented challenge, challenge because about 37% of, of charities can accept a digital donation. And that's where the power of open banking payments can come in. Open banking payments are faster, they're more secure. And when I say faster, most payments can go in uh, within 15 seconds of the payment being authorised into the charity's bank account. More secure because you have to go through the authentication, whether that be using biometrics or for using logging in using your online banking details. And they're much cheaper than the traditional payment flows because when you're for charities, they're using the merchant merchants like Visa and MasterCard, which charge a fee against those payments. So even though you're giving 10, potentially 10 pounds to a charity, 10 pounds does not necessarily mean it reached the charities. What I want to do now is actually, and I'll just pause the video before it starts. So one of the things that I want to show you now is the our chart, the charities donation um, solution that we helped Open Banking Excellence uh, develop using our consent widgets and our payments API. Now, by all means, feel free to scan the QR code if you want, because that is what the entry point that we chose to use, because QR codes come quite in fashion because it can be used in webinars like this or in posters or in letters or any correspondence to help enable users to enter a digital journey more efficiently. So if I kick off the video, what you're going to see once, yeah, so again, using the QR code, we're getting direct into the charity flow. The user is getting able to select a specific charity they wish to donate to, and you can have one, you can have multiple. We're now then picking a pre-selected amount or um, customizing. Now we can go up to 10,000 pounds because most banks can uh, up, go up to 10,000 pounds based on their faster payments limit, which are obviously no, not many people carry around 10,000 pounds. Now this is where we are into our consent and payments widget. We have a number of providers. In this case, I'm going to put nationwide. We could have put more providers, but because of usability, we chose not to. We're now entering the authentication journey at nationwide using biometrics. And we're now selecting the account. And we're, and we're adding some specific uh, questions that nationwide require to us to answer. It's now get, the authentication has been successful. And now we're authorizing and redirecting back the payment and redirecting back to the flow to complete the automated gift aid. This video takes about a minute and a half to complete, and it can be a lot more uh, quicker as you uh, as you do uh, as you work through it rather than just doing it via the video. The point being is, it's efficient, it's cheaper, it's faster, it's more secure. Now, that's two of the examples of some of our innovative APIs. We've got a whole 
a catalogue of APIs that people can use. And what I'm hoping that the, going in those two deep dives into those specific APIs is showing that it, open banking and APIs is not purely about data aggregation. There is a lot more value propositions that can be achieved through, through using open banking APIs. That, I'll, I'll put that, some of the slides together just as a bit of a context to actually open up to a more of a debate and get some views from the community about what, what, are you, what, what are you building? What challenges do you have? What do we need to do more as a community to innovate further? So I'd like to open it up to the floor. I don't know if there's any specific questions. And also I've got John and Omar here who are more than happy to answer any specific technical details as well, if there's any specific technical questions that you'd like to go through. So we've got a question here from Dan. What what do you think of what do you think of open finance, especially after OPIE for banking in the UK? More carrot, less stick. So if I give give a give a view, and then I'm happy for John or Omar to give a view and also open up to more of a conversation. Is one of the main challenges in at this early get-go of open banking was literally you had to comply with the regulations and um, a number of the banks are still compli complying and not, not innovating and therefore the challenge being to open finance would be is that there's not one of the, the um, shall I start, I'll start that again, one of the challenges has been the definition of an interface. Now not every bank provides an interface, uh, an API is an interface, the to uh, manage custom interface, which means more custom develop. And if we don't get the standards right for the other products like pensions and investments, we are going to have the same challenges. And if we, we have to have an element of legislation to actually push it forward, but there has to be a balance between compliance and innovation. I don't know if John or Omar, if you wanted to add anything to that. Uh, from a from a data point of view, the one of the key aspects is each individual bank is is going to be doing things in in isolation, um, and they will have to be spending time and resource. Um, and that is, if you if you're only going for a stick, then they're going to be doing. And we can see banks are starting to do the categorization that we've been doing for some time. Uh, in an attempt to catch up to try and compete whereas actually if we they start embracing open finance in in a realistic way then that becomes a, a becomes a carrot because we create this community where the api uh, those apis are linked with enriched data behind it by people who are specializing in that particular aspect as opposed to uh, being a jack of all trades and that's 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 where my feelings towards the from a data point of view especially uh, machine learning uh, as well that's where my views are towards this john i hope that dan that answers your question by all means feel free to come off mute or uh, and answer or is there any other questions Maybe this is more of a question for Omar potentially. So, uh, what open banking framework is most de developer friendly? Uh, Berlin Group, FDX, OPIE. There might be some another standard that we're, we find easier than others. I'm not, I don't I don't know the specifics of Berlin Group, FDX. Well, I've kind of like read the specs, but then like this, like like OPIE, like it is. 
some says it's good that it is based on the standard like like OAuth and OpenID, uh, which uh, I know like for some like developers, as in when you start looking into it, like you can be a buyer of all of the concepts. Um, but it still is quite good that you can have a lot of documentation about it when it comes like with the OAuth and OpenID, in this case for OBE. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not that familiar with the very good FEX about uh, the differences uh, in, in the specs. But I, I suppose at this point you're making that the more that we people use all open standards, the more efficient it would be to develop. Yeah, like mainly because this it's a sense that uh, it's easy to also find, like, you know, if you have any issues or any, like, troubleshooting, things like that, there's, there's a lot of developers and all the APIs that they use in the same standard, so you might have to find more information about it. As in, if you go towards a more really specific variations of uh, already a certain, like, um, protocol, then it's harder to find information troubleshoot. Um, yeah. No, I agree. I, I agree with wholeheartedly with that because certainly we've um, certainly as we've added more and more connections to different providers, we have seen had to create a number of custom adapters to make those integrations because not everyone is following a specific standard. Now that's not to say that's wrong, but there's of course a lot of, of banks that have actually produced their own custom APIs rather and not followed any standards. So it's kind of a challenge and sometimes it can be hard to know before we before we even start and the power of documentation is key to that because we have seen a lot of when we're trying to make some connections with certain providers that the documentation is probably you know, lacking the detail which means that it takes longer and longer to create those connections and those integrations So we've got a question here. So how do open banking? Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, it's clicking the screen there. So how do open banking API structures based on these frameworks compare, complement the BIN API? Uh, more are BIN more for internal organisations or processes, and open banking for third parties? I'm not sure, if John or Omar, have you got a view on that one? Uh, I, I personally haven't come across or used the uh, BIAN uh, API standard, um, but I'd be interested to know how they would compare and contrast them. Uh, is this yet another competing standard, um, or is it um, compared to, the, say, the Berlin Group or the uh, FDX, or is it, as, as uh, Andre suggests, uh, a complementary thing where we can... Uh, actually they're they're for different horses for courses that we can start using yeah it's same for me as as an i haven't uh, used to come across with a by an api um so uh the next question are played and tank becoming commoditized as data aggregators that's an interesting question and a very um, uh, provocative question. Um, I don't know, John or Omar, I'm quite happy for you to maybe field that question first and then I'll give my um, viewpoint, your views on what they're doing. So it is, as uh, it definitely made me smile when I saw those two names coming in. Um, as as uh, a commodity, that is that next step in that um, productization. You obviously have that bespoke, and then you have that commoditization towards the end of a sort of a sort of a, a standard becoming useful. The there is an aspect where, as as David just says, farming off the work and giving someone else the the requirement to create those custom connectors to. To, to map between those is is a resource intensive thing. However, one of the, the the clear advantages is you are ensuring you're always getting the data the way that 
you need it. Um, and actually what if you commoditize something like that, all you're doing is you're negating these additional standards and you're creating the, the played standard or the tink standard, uh, which you then just in, in, ingest data from um, and you're using them as that part. Um, a lot of what I do within the data team um, actually relies on that raw transactional data um, rather than that processed data. So to have it commoditized to a level potentially makes it less usable. Um, and so I will always see a, a need for ingesting it within um, within within the business. However, that doesn't mean that the products that we then um, uh, sort of uh, produce are are aggregated, but they're enriched aggregators. And that's the important thing. It's not as as the, the topic of this workshop suggests, it's not just about uh, data aggregation. It's it's important to know that we enrich the data and that enrichment is what is should be driving open finance as opposed to just that aggregation. So uh, the, the providers that can do just one are going to be um, fewer and far between. And I think, and, and to, to just add to John's point, I think any organisation just focuses on just being a data aggregator, it just is going to limit their ability to support uh, people, uh, companies' ambitions to innovate and develop that innovative proposition. Data aggregation, categorisation, it's just one element of the puzzle. It's how you use the data to power your and propositions is the key and you know, any company that limits their view on that is just is not going to have, be successful as my view from a business perspective so any more questions mm -hmm. Would it, I suppose the question is, would anyone appreciate a view of how they would, if they would, uh, to get into our sandbox, if they were interested in that, just to see if we have or, or any of our documentation? Because as I, I'm a very strong advocate of doc documentation. I hope that came across in the presentation. Because literally, without documentation, documentation is code as far as I'm concerned, and uh, it, about, it enhances the product. Would that be uh, as useful for anyone? On the, Paul, oh, I'm happy to see the feedback on the chat. Should we do, should we do it for a fact and then see if it generates any more questions? And, and if not, we'll um, bring the session to a close. So if you just give me a moment. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So, Can everyone see the screen okay? Hopefully. Take silence as a good thing. So this is the Money Hub Enterprise um, website. Um, if you were interested in uh, getting an overview of our doc, uh, API overview, we've got both our data intelligence and payment APIs. We also have, as I mentioned, our documentation which has a number of what all the different use cases, payments, categorizations, connections. Uh, and we also have a links to our, our, our Swagger docs. So each of, the, each of these different use cases that our clients are using. Um, we also have a getting started guides for anyone, so how to create an API client and some interactive videos. But if I was to David, sorry to interrupt, it's still on the website page. Is it still on the website? Apologies, maybe I've shared the wrong things. Apologies for that. Let me try that again. Yeah, it's going to see the website again. Yeah, you can see the website, yes. You can see the website, that's good. Okay, uh, so again, so apologies for that. 
So as I said, we have our API overview, which is a data intelligence and payments APIs. We also have our documentation, which outlines up our core, core things and all the features that you can achieve. I mentioned at the start of the session, we have our Swagger documentation for anyone's interested. But also, if I was to go back to the, we also have in our getting started guide, we have our interactive videos to help support that. But going back to that, if you were interested in uh, getting access, you would then just log into our register with our admin portal and that would start your journey. That's how simple and easy it is if you wanted to go and have a look at our APIs and, and get started really efficiently. That was just a quick whistle talk tour just to see if it generated any more specific questions. said in terms of uh, that getting started um, if you are interested in getting started it is it's free to use for the uh, for that initial period so if you do um, it's, it's a simple request and you can you can quickly start accessing your own accounts just as a um, and use to a high level those those apis that we've just shown you um, and that we have within those swagger docs that which are uh, available. Okay. If there's not more questions, I, I'd just like to thank everyone that did um, ask a question. I hope um, you found the work the session useful and insightful. And I'd like to also thank John and Omar for their support and answering the questions. So if there's no further more, I'll bring the session to close and thank you very much for everyone's attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.